This evening, we have a comparison. Now, of all the comparisons one can make, would you not agree we've picked a good one? I call it a difficult comparison <clears throat> um, because there are certain things which are quite obvious that makes it difficult, and I hope to mention them and then show a way of avoiding the difficulty. The writings of both of these men don't exist, since Socrates never wrote anything. The Buddha never wrote anything. We owe it to their followers to discover what we can about these two great figures. Now, I have chosen them because in my own thinking and my own life, they played such a formidable role. But when you try to get some understanding of what these two people were, you have an initial difficulty because writing in India, northern India, was non-existent at the time of the birth and the development of early Buddhism. The writing of the sutras, or the suttas, didn't really begin until the uh, first century of our era. On the other hand, Socrates, through Plato, all that we know about Socrates was written by someone who was living contemporaneous with him. And a matter of fact, they had a great student-teacher relationship. So therefore, we have that initial difficulty that we have a great deal of literary material on the one side that we can puzzle about, and on the other, we don't. We have a oral tradition. Now, there's not... Uh, there are some great oral traditions. Certainly we know Homer is one of the greatest examples of a great oral tradition, where for hundreds of years people preserved intact the, right, the utterances of someone earlier, such as Homer, so it's not unusual that there's a vital and reliable oral tradition. But still, the kinds of things that we would normally look for to compare two people aren't present. Even the term isn't proper. This is really a title. It should be Gautama, which is his name. But it's the fact that the Buddha and Gautama have merged so that we talk about Buddha thinking of Gautama and we don't, we don't in any way find any difficulty in recognizing that we're talking about someone who represents one of the great figures of enlightenment and, in fact, is enlightenment itself, since that term derived from Bodhi means mind, mind. Now, look here. How shall we approach it then? Here we have great detail derived from someone who was his student, Plato, and therefore we can find many interesting things to talk about, but then we were not going to find anything comparable on this side. Well then, how are we possibly going to make a comparison when we're dealing with unequal things? Well, luckily enough, there's an easier way to go. <clears throat> Let's see if we can approach it in terms of what we know from the early tradition of Buddhism and see whether we can study the teachings, the early teachings, and the struggles implicit in those teachings, and compare them across the board with Socrates. So therefore, I'm going to see whether I can recreate a kind of picture of Buddhism, and comparable-wise, I'm going to try to do the same thing on the Socratic side. So I think it would be easiest to do first by going into um, um, Buddhism. Now, normally they talk about Hinayana, Mahayana, they use various names, Theravada. Oh, in order to avoid that language, the Buddhism, early Buddhism, is really Nikaya or Agma. Now, what does that avoid? As you know, Maha means great. 
So if you say Mahayana Buddhism, you're talking about something that you consider to be great, and if you're going to contrast it with something else, it's going to be lesser. So this distinction using the term Mahayana Hinayana should be avoided. And an easy way to do that is to talk about it in the Pali tradition or the Sanskrit tradition, and that separates it. Uh, formally, it's called the early Buddhism is called the Nikaya, which is really rooted in the canon of works called the Sarvastiveda system. And it's from that view that we're going to take a look at this curious thing that Gautama or the Buddha developed. Now, What's interesting is that he has a view, he recreates our view, our everyday view of ourselves. And in his analysis of the human condition, he's really going to develop how he saw himself and what he emerged out of. Well, the first set of what he talks about is that what you have to see is that we get a view of ourselves as a result of the way in which the body conditions us. Right? The body itself conditions us. What does that mean? That means that as a result of whatever it is we experience, we get a kind of idea of a center. It is we personally who experience things. Sensations impinge upon us equally to feelings. Right? Our feelings, we have them. Therefore, we are, we have the feelings. And in the same way, when I see something, whatever it may be, any kind of perception, hearing, sight, and that, and that, it obviously entails the same kind of phenomena, which is when I see something, I know it's not me, I'm here, it's there. So I build up another more formidable notion of the center being essential to myself. That idea of that building up of the center goes on and there's something else that conditions it too. We have all kinds of ideas, mental ideas, and we add that to our experience. We add it. That is to say we see through our own mental constructions and that too builds it up. Why, the very language I use, I see the tree. Ah. I, I've been taught from my earliest days that you can't make a statement without putting a subject in the beginning. So therefore I'm obliged to say, I, subject, see the tree. That enforces the censure again. If someone comes up and says, by the way, I don't doubt that you have some kind of a perception of that thing you call tree. Are you equally good at uh, perceiving this? Because, after all, I do want to make sure that you are, in fact, making sense when you utter that. Like, oh, well, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I prefer not to do that. Right. So in the same way, that whole mental panorama that we have creates again and again the fact that there is something in the center, most central to us. And of it all, we also have what we call a personal, a personal sense of consciousness. Right? If we're pushed to this, we say, well, look here, I'll tell you what. I mean, I, I know that I exist. I mean, I think, therefore I am. I mean, I think, I, I think, I think, therefore I am. I'm conscious of the fact that there is an am, and that's an I, and that's what's doing the thinking, you see? I mean, I have a personal consciousness. These are the things that condition us to accept the notion that central to us there really is this core being sometimes called a self, an Atman, not the, uh, with a capital A, but a core self. Now, it's through that that we then get this idea of ourself and the self therefore emerges. That's what we call ourselves. That's the way we understand everything. Now, another way of putting this is to say that See, we can stay in this model and build up this whole idea, which is the 12-4 conditioning arising from this. See, I just wrote it out here so you can see it. But all of this 12-fold arising, which is very famous, can really be reduced to one sentence. Right? And that is, 
this being that occurs from the rising of this that arises. This being that occurs, this being that occurs, me. From the arising of this, these five things, that arises. Now you can break that down to the twelvefold arising or the twelvefold condition of being, but it's the same thing. What does that then lead us to? Right? It leads us, therefore, to the fact that there is something there, and it does basically four major things, because this thing has desire. By heavens, that's fundamental to us. Right? Absolutely. Right? And because of that desire, four things happen. We grasp for what we want. That defines our existence. We grasp this, we grasp that. And as a result of that, we define our existence. We got that made, right? And it's because of that desire for existence that creates in their game the idea of one's birth, right? And the whole process of living until we finally die and rebirth again. So we can see this entire 12-fold conditional arising, which is really nothing other than, which is one idea, just one idea. That is, there either is or there is not this thing in the center of us that has an independent of existence. For if we do have it, then everything we've said is true. If it's not, then there's a fundamental ignorance. There's a fundamental ignorance that comes out of the way we've been conditioned by these things. And if that's the case, you see, the twelvefold conditional rising emerges out of just one word, ignorance. All of these other words are just forms of the same thing. Now, that's what the Buddha is doing. That's what he sees. That's what he says. He sought the quest for enlightenment. Now, um, when I wrote this down, I wanted this to come first and the second, so I'm going to switch it for a moment, okay? Now, faced with this, the Buddha, therefore, became, in terms of the earliest talks, he came face to face with those three things, which is birth, death, right? sickness or impermanence. Right? He saw that, and through that he saw nothing there but suffering. And he saw the fourth thing, which really changed everything. He saw someone who he could regard as truly enlightened. Therefore, he said, good heavens, maybe the way out of this ignorance is the way of knowledge. Well, if he's in the way of knowledge, then um, That therefore what I must do is to try to become one of these people, one of these wise ones. And as we know, to become like that, he took the path of austerities, an ascetic. He became a, a, a profound meditator, and he lived, therefore, in an isolated manner, uh, uh, a wanderer, naked wanderer, living on handouts and developed concentration. He developed meditation. Now, he had two great teachers, Kalyama and Ramaputta. These men were masters of meditation. They were masters of meditation, and there are nine levels of this curious thing. <clears throat> and when he worked, therefore, with these ascetic masters, meditators, they were particularly skilled in what is called the seventh and eighth stage of meditation or concentration. 
They were very proficient. He learned from them. He learned from them that you can enter into this whole realm of meditation and you can get into what is called the Arupa stage, which is four stages. Rupa means form. Arupa, formless or non-form. And the first is the, the great one, which is considered the sphere of an infinite experience of infinite space. Right. Next stage, which is the uh, sixth, is a, the sense that there's an infinite consciousness extending throughout the entire sense of reality. Right. He went through those, and he mastered through Kalyama that basically there's a nothingness, a profound, infinite nothingness at the root of existence. Then when he went with Ramapatuta, he went beyond that where he gained the insight, you know what, that there's neither perception nor non-perception, using perception in the sense of all the ways in which one can come to know anything. Therefore, it's quite important in studying Buddhism to recognize that this is the, this is his early experience. This is his early experience. This is what led him to become a Buddha because he saw that he still didn't have the answer to these things, the nature of suffering didn't see that all of those great and profound experiences in any way contributed to conclusion. That makes him a genius, a spiritual genius, because those that can hold on to their question become geniuses of an age. Right? He held on to the question, the fundamental question. He didn't give it up through all kinds of states of profound meditation and satori or samadhi. He didn't give them up. So therefore, he sought to discover how you can go beyond. This is called right. This is the whole thing is sometimes called. Uh, I think I have another one here. Yeah. Right concentration. Sometimes they call it uh, meditation. And we'll call it right meditation. And the Eightfold Path, that's it's the eighth step. So we had to go beyond this. And so we went to the ninth stage of meditation. And this is the great one called uh, Niroda Samapati. And that is the cessation, the total cessation of all mental functioning. While there is still a vitality. Two things emerge from this, by the way. One is that it, at this stage itself, it's possible to find a division within them, by the way. Right? One is tranquility, a profound tranquility. And the other is, which is later developed in the uh, Theravada school called the Vipassana, that in this state, the cessation of mental functioning, that is the same thing as opening the mind to profound insights or intuitions into wisdom. Now, there's some Buddhists, therefore, in the modern world who stay with this side, some go beyond and go here. It's out of the same stage, the ninth stage of meditation. This later becomes to be the way uh, um, that uh, Theravada Buddhism and later Zen Buddhism emerged. Uh, let, let me now go back. After therefore breaking through on this ninth level, the highest stage of meditation, what is it that he saw? What is it that he saw? He saw that, that everyday existence, everyday existence is this. That's everyday existence. That's what everyday existence is. Birth, death, sickness, suffering. That's everyday existence. That's what it is. A fundamental, you could even say, a fundamental incompleteness. Now, they usually the Sanskrit word they use for that, of course, is dukkha. And that admits of a wide range of translations. But it's a fundamental incompleteness about the very core 
of what we express as the, the realm of appearances. So you either can say it's everyday existence is incomplete, and since it's incomplete and we struggle in it, it produces this thing called suffering. And Buddha went through this ninth stage of meditation. He said, by heavens, you know what? There's a cause to that. Desire is the cause of that. Hey, you know what? This whole way in which we built up our everyday world, you know what produced that? Desire. Desire, the whole thing, that whole production is the result of just one thing. Desire is the cause of all of that. And you know what? If you can see that, that's the way out. That's nirvana. Nirvana literally means, vana is the senses, blowing out the senses. Right? Blowing out the senses, blowing out desire. If this whole production of ours is the result of our fundamental ignorance, well then if you can understand and perceive that ignorance directly, then you're out of it. You're out of it. That's the Four Noble Truths. Now to do it, is you know what you have to do? Eight things. And that's where the Buddhists get that great image of the wheel, eight spokes. Now, I would say that many people have talked about right views and right thought, right speech, right action, right work, right effort. It's this last two, right mindfulness and right concentration, which we call, also call meditation. Now, This is something that he came to. Now, what is so interesting about that is this. Remember, we said that it takes a true greatness to hold on to your fundamental question. But it takes even a greater degree of personal integrity to be able to hold on to the question after a breakthrough experience. Through a samadhi, through an enlightenment experience, through an overwhelmingly powerful experience, through a crystal luminosity experience, however you put it, that means the person is simply enlightened. So what? The person who can hold on to their question now in that state and then say to themselves, can I understand the process that I just went through? Can I understand the process I went through with such clarity that I can understand all the distinctions I made that preceded and were the cause of my own enlightenment? Let this represent, as it were, say, just for an, an illustration, 30 seconds. If we could get a look at the state of mind of Gautama the Buddha, 30 seconds before he broke through that ninth stage of meditation, if we could see all the things that were in place for that experience, and then take a look at then what he then did with it, because he returned to his question, he returned to his question about the nature of this, to put into words with such clarity so that he could communicate this nature of this, because this is what he had to get out of in order to have the experience. So he held on to his question with the purest logic and the most beautiful, precise language he was able to express the nature of his own ignorance, and therefore ignorance of man. Because on this level, it's no longer his own, but the fundamental mechanism of the conditioning forces that operate to produce this image that we have called the self. And therefore, he could say, Anatman. 
an Atman. No Atman, no self. Nothing private and personal and unique lies at the root of our existence. What is it then he was able to express and break through this ah, Four Noble Truths? That's what he did. Four Noble Truths. This is it. Now, when you can express something with this clarity, other people can therefore understand it. Say it's clear. It admits of a great precision. And all they have to say then is, are you sure about how you can get there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll lay it out for you. Oh, okay. I'll do it. I'll risk it. That becomes the spiritual seeker. And the Buddha was able to do that. And therefore, he included the past experiences that he had. He didn't reject the old meditation and the meditators that he had, nor the way of life. He included it. He included it and added that ninth stage. Now, he came out with a very interesting basic, he went beyond this and said, look here, I just don't want to talk about the nature of ignorance. He said, what I'd like to show is that fundamental to our whole logical way of reasoning, fundamental to our logical, what is our logic? The way in which we rationally encounter the world, the fundamentals of the way in which we try to grasp our reality ourselves and our reality. It's basically four stages. It's a logic built up of four stages. And these are the only possibilities that we've been taught. And this is the Kachutkoti, or the four uh, logical possibilities according to uh, 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 early Buddhism. That is to say, you can assert that something is, that it's not, that it's both it is and it is not, and neither is nor is it not. Buddhism came along, Buddha, Gautama Buddha, and says, hey, I got news for you. It's all wrong. Fundamentally, that will not be able to be of any value when you're trying to work yourself through this problem. Therefore, the whole mechanism and the whole mental apparatus that we have in trying to anticipate and understand our experience is in principle rejected. That leaves the person, therefore, only with one thing. Wow. Just you have to take a look and see whether you can go to the ninth stage or not. Now, there was no writing in this period of time. Uh, within a hundred years or so, uh, the great emperor Ahsoka uh, created a monument for Gautama, somewhere around 250 BC. Uh, when but did he live, by the way? Uh, what, uh, Ahsoka? About 250. Uh, about 250 BC? Yeah. Buddha? No, no, no. no, no that's See, right. there's a big problem with dating, you oh, know. Okay. And let me tell you the problem with dating. It's, all, it's always the same. Uh, there are different groups of scholars, and they vary from 500, actually 545, birth of Buddha, to uh, 350. Now, that's an enormous difference. Oh, yes, it's a, but a pretty large ballpark. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The German school, the German scholars, uh, often put him uh, 350 BC and because they want to bring it more forward for reasons which I don't understand, but they do. <laughs> well, it's, I don't know. Uh, but I think the way to judge it might be to say, what thing do we have that's really in place? What we have is that they are... There are monuments that were created in honor of the Buddha, we know, at 250 B.C., right? B, what they call B.C.E., before the Common Era. How long would it take somebody to wake up to the fact that there was someone great living among them who had an influence among a group of people that extended to such an extent that someone later, including an emperor, might sit around and inaugurate a... a uh, a piece of sculpting in his honor. So in that way, you can get some idea <clears throat> of how far back you go. And I don't have any clue, by the way, how to make it more perfect, but that's the way I reason. Now, <clears throat> let's move for a moment, OK? Let's move to this, another one. <clears throat> Here in this beautiful picture, as you can see, is Socrates having his morning cappuccino. <laughs> Now, 
What's different, you see, what's different between Socrates and Gautama, very clearly, right from the offset, is that he is engaged in interrelationships. Fundamental. That he has a way of exploring himself and others that uses dialogue. Both are into meditation, we know that. We know that Socrates went through some very profound meditations if we give evidence to in the symposium, which would, might be equivalent to a Maha Samadhi, where um, uh, Alcibiades is describing Socrates standing in one spot for 24 hours, holding on to just one, one idea. And we have it also from the Phaedrus Republic and symposium. Okay, now, we have something else. We also know that Socrates saw himself in a line of greats, of philosophers. He saw that he was just one in a long series. So he saw himself in a spiritual tradition. Now, one of the most remarkable things in history that has ever occurred is that, <laughs> wouldn't it have been interesting if the Gautama Buddha had a Plato? Wouldn't it have been interesting if Jesus had a Plato? He had a Paul. And they're very different. Socrates woke up Plato and through, therefore, the writings of Plato, we can get and recover an image of Socrates. We can also get it from Xenophon. We can also get it from some comedies that were written at his time. I think Plato, therefore, is doing something that will help us. While he was trying to grasp the nature of Socratic thought, he was really trying to express the philosopher as he saw him. That perception of Socrates as a philosopher, trying to grasp his essence, you know, the very nature of what it is that he saw in him, occupies again dialogue after dialogue. It becomes the unity of all of his thinking. He, he is absorbed into it. But what does a dialogue require? A dialogue requires, does it not, that you have to be willing to become the object of attention, exclusive attention of the other. Huh? Engage in a dialogue with someone to whatever degree that is genuine, you become the object of their exclusive attention, concern. You know that if you're the object of a dialogue, that you are required, you are required to try to come up with the best that's in you. Under questioning, under questioning, right, the skill of the Socratic questioning is to help that process emerge. Therefore, there must be trust involved. But the kind of trust that's occupying in Socrates is not academic. By that I mean he encounters people where they live. He encounters them in the agora, in the marketplace. He's bringing whatever he is into the marketplace and he's both engaging and engaging himself through this curious thing called dialogue. That dialogue for him is a duty, for he received from the, what we know from the Apology, the duty to be a philosopher, which he says is from God himself, to become a philosopher and to go around and question himself and others. Therefore, there's a very high, let's call it now, a spiritual occupation. I mean, what better boss would you want, right? than to have God for your boss, right? I mean, 
He says, you know, I wouldn't give up my post on Potidaea when I was being commanded by my commanding officers to hold on to a post. He said, now that I've been commanded by God to be a philosopher, I dare say, he said, I'm not going to give up my position as a philosopher. He said, how foolish that would be. So therefore, he enters the realm of the spiritual through dialogue, through questioning. And what does he question? What does he do to us? In all of the dialogues, we can bring it down to a few things. He wants to know about the nature of excellence. Excellence. He wants to know about excellence. You see, that's a Buddha question. Right? How is that similar? How is the quest for excellence the same as this ninth category? So he went beyond all categories. He went beyond all categories, which means he had to get out of all conditioning. That's the way he calls it, the five conditionings. He had to get out of all of that conditioning factors to put them aside and enter into and participate in the nature of reality, presumably bringing someone along with him so he can check on his own reasoning as well as on the other in a spirit of sincerity. Why does he do that? He says, because, he says, I want to, and the, I want to understand. I want to understand. You know, among the Eightfold Path, there's no understanding. It's not understanding. He says, I want to understand. Now, what is it that he wants to understand? Is what I want to understand is what it is that I am doing most excellently when I am exploring myself and others. What is that? What kind of a state of mind is that? Because if through it an excellence emerges, then it emerges not because I'm teaching excellence, but because in the very process of engaging, an excellence emerges. Well, then he can say, wait a minute, this excellence that emerges, is it one or many? Uh, maybe it's one behind it all. So he brings people into engaging about whether or not the particular excellence they're trying to exhibit is one or many, he's getting them to consider their own excellence. Now, this question about if one's own excellence means that um, you have to face intimately one's own, one's own fundamental Ignorance. As he takes Mino and other people through the dialogue dealing with the problem of what is virtue or what is excellence, he has to become, come to grips with the fact that he's engaging in something that he's trying to do excellently He's searching for excellence, trying to understand excellence while he's engaged in activity with someone else where they're both trying to do their best most excellently on the very question of what is excellence. So they're using a dialogue as they're participating together so that they can awaken their own th higher thought processes but they can't do that unless they're willing to face that maybe their most fundamental ideas of what it is to know are the very things that are blocking their understanding, their perception of excellence. Ah. That's the same thing as the condition arising of mental functions, same thing. Now, why is he doing that? He has one assumption. 
I believe, and that is that there's nothing more dangerous than knowledge. Nothing more dangerous than knowledge. Because whenever you have it and you act on it, you always know that you're right. And if you know you're right, you're justified in doing what you're doing. And if you're justified in doing what you're doing, you can act with the unity of your will, and you can then free all of your energies towards the accomplishment of your goal. Socrates is going to show in dialogue after dialogue is that is the fundamental illusion. That's the illusion. Because in every dialogue, Socrates is going to say that there is a whole set of key terms, knowledge, understanding, love, beauty, all of the great words, all of the great words, excellence, justice, fairness, temperance, courage, all of these words which we always use, and he's going to show in one way after another that all of these terms can only be used properly, only can be used properly when they are applied in the realm of the highest vision of reality. And when they are not, all of these words then are nothing other than ways in which we justify our own efforts to do this and do that and to create an image of ourselves. Why does he do that? Because he's got the next step. He says, you know what? Since I can say that, this is really what knowledge is, being able to know how to use these terms in respect to this highest vision. Any other idea of knowledge is absurd. If you reach this kind of knowledge, he's going to say, there's no difference, therefore, between knowing and willing, for no one does wrong knowingly. There's no tension between will and knowledge, so long as you understand that it's this kind of knowledge that he's talking about. Now, this other kind of knowledge, he calls it's a slave. He said that, you know what, he said, whatever kind of knowledge, just, let's call this the common knowledge. He said, common knowledge, whatever it might be, is like a slave. Uh, it lets itself be dragged about by other states of mind, other states of mind, and for other purposes. It's purely arbitrary, it's neutral, it has no value to it, it's perfectly uninteresting. That is to say, you know, as we know so well today, uh, we can train our people to develop all kinds of techniques, to master all kinds of uh, weapons of destruction, and the people who do it can go home and have a cup of coffee and listen to a Beethoven quartet after it's over and enjoy all kinds of aesthetic states of mind. That is to say, our view of knowledge is necessarily right, indifferent to value. It is neutral. It is, as they call it, uh, it's indifferent or neutral in value. It's neither right nor wrong. And all you have to do is possess it use it, feel justified in your use of it. And Socrates is engaging person after person saying, excuse me, these words you're using, I'll show you, don't make any sense whatsoever. The way you understand these terms, as a matter of fact, let's go back now, the way you've been using these terms condition you to be what you are. This is conditional rising in Platonic universe. So therefore, what's the dialogue? The dialogue that Socrates engages in is always personal, so that the particular character of the person is, is as a result of the thesis they have. They don't have an arbitrary thesis. The thesis or the position they hold is nothing other than being expressed through a particular mask, which is nothing other than the fabrication of their thesis or their ideas put together into a unity. Therefore, in a dialogue, the characters, each one of them represent a particular state of mind, and whatever action they go through in the dialogue is totally consistent with that basic view they have of themselves and their thinking. Therefore, the way to truth 
the way of truth in Platonic universe is to understand, to understand that we have conditioned ourselves. We have conditioned ourselves. Our culture, right? our unreflective, unexamined life, that, all of those forces are bringing us into something strange and alien to our true nature. Well, then, how do you get out of it? He says, well, in each dialogue, he has five things going. Play. Every dialogue is a play. Every genuine dialogue is the highest kind of play. If you can engage someone in a genuine dialogue, that's the highest kind of play. Uh, Jan Huizingen has a great quote on that. He says, uh, uh, man should really be defined as not homo sapiens, but homo ludens. Man, the player. And he quotes, of course, Plato, and, and uh, Jan Huizingen does when he says that uh, for Plato, play is the highest human activity consecrated to the gods. Therefore, it's a divine expression of man's excellence, which is why they produce the Olympics. But to play with that kind of inner reflection, challenging yourself, is itself a purification of ignorance. Therefore, Socrates has to play the game of irony to awaken within the other person eros, love. Love of what? Of a new kind of beauty discovered through the mind. For the mind alone can see pure beauty, nothing else can, according to Plato. And the way, therefore, to that penetrating vision into the nature of ultimate reality as beauty itself, which he calls the perfection of beauty. Right? Great, beautiful image, isn't it? Perfection of beauty. It's through a training of the mind, the dialectic. Now, few people get to this level of Platonic thought because we don't need it in our everyday world or even our most of our intellectual activities because it's the special kind of very disciplined reasoning that can go from beauty itself, can go from beauty itself to the very fundamental notion, the good. To go from an experience of ultimate reality as a unitary vision to the good presupposes you have mastered and have known how to participate in a very strenuous dialectic because the very assumptions you're going to be making about your experience of beauty itself or the nature of ultimate reality must be examined carefully in such a way that it can open the mind to something that's beyond knowledge, totally beyond knowledge and beyond essence and truth itself to reach the good. That therefore means he is no longer conditioned even by his highest contemplation. Another way of putting it, the Buddha too had to go beyond the seventh and eighth level of meditation to reach into the nature of nirvana. So here too, Plato is doing the same thing and telling us Socrates is teaching which is that through the most strenuous use of an inner dialectic, a mastery of the dialectic, you can prepare the mind for the grandest of all seeing, which is no seeing at all, but seeing things just the way they are. Now, uh, So I would like to say, going back now, that it's difficult, you know, to make a comparison between Gautama and Socrates. And yet, what's most important for me personally is that these two figures have the same curious kind of what uh, has been called numinosity, right? Not luminosity, numinosity. Someone existed way back 
before there were any kinds of recording devices, even writing. And they were able to be themselves so well and so perfectly, simply being what they are, that that numinosity, that sense of reality in them, spread through the ages. So now the very mention of the term anywhere awakens a curious thing. It's like you can reach back through time and in some way you can engage in the fact that there has been an extremely profound, if not the most profound individual in history. Now here's the curious thing with Socrates. You might be able to do the same thing with Socrates, but I bet you can't do it without smiling. There's something funny about Socrates. Right? I mean, you can't put nickels in his head like you do in a Buddha statue, you know? There is something funny about Socrates. There's something comic about him. Nietzsche saw this. Every, everyone who reads Socrates knows, man, it's comic. There's something that is comic, and yet he led a tragic life in that sense of his ending. But he went beyond both tragedy and comedy, and he emerges as an archetypal figure that is very curious because this archetypal figure of Socrates requires so Plato. And therefore you have a curious you have a curious archetypal figure that always combines two in dialogue. And yet, from my reflections, I think they were comparable on the highest level of their vision. And I wanted to share that with you this evening. Thank you for letting me take you through it. Always like talking about it. So let me throw it open and we can go somewhere else with it. I had a bunch of quotes, but I'm not going to use them. Ah, yes, you were thinking? <laughs> um, actually, I'm curious as to the purification that you see that comes about and the achievement of excellence that you see comes about in the process of the dialogue. Can you, dis can you describe a bit more or how you see that as happening? I think that the, the idea of a sheath, right, a sheath, a veil, a sheath, that we have levels, I'm going to call them, um, since they have a unity, there are levels of discourse that are possible. when we engage with someone where we recognize it's essential to ourselves that we speak with the utmost integrity and sincerity, right? Okay, then the first, the superficial, we would like to cut through as much as we can. But they condition us too, don't they? Right? These views we have, this manner and the style that we have when we go out in the everyday world, that conditions us so that we have to put that aside some way. We can say that might be the mask, the first wave of the mask. Right? So when we then try to find a different way of dialoguing with another set of ideas to engage with someone exploring what we think, why we think what we do, we try to show that these have a certain unity and they fit together and can represent us on our most meaningful level. We always find that there are some of these ideas that we're going to link together, because ideas link, to, link themselves together uh, like in a mosaic or like in a musical piece, different patterns fit together, and we have discordant ideas, etc. And so we are then going to have to face the fact that there are a couple of these things while we thought we knew we didn't. And therefore we now have to engage ourselves on what are the implications of not fully understanding one of these key ideas that is so important to me. When that takes place, often the whole structure falls into question. 
At that moment, if it falls into question, we have to face the experience of not knowing. We know we're stepping into a realm where, uh-oh, I may not know what I think I know, right? All right? So you're stepping into the experience of not knowing. And to persist takes an unusual kind of courage and integrity to words that you have to call upon to then go into the next level. This next level, each one of these ideas, then you have to see its necessity, and you're now creating a much more interesting pattern that really is forged out of your experience with dialogue. That purifies, going back to your question, that is a purification. Because using Buddhist terminology, all of this is conditional arising. And we're willing to suspend it and enter into with someone who, who, because it presupposes some kind of trust. And then we have to trust ourselves. So in that respect, we then have to enter into trust. We have to have a degree of courage. We have to call upon our own intuition to try to help us. Right? And we have to stay level-headed through the whole thing. Right. have to be fair both to the terms we use and the other person. Right. We have to, in the hope that we're trying to reach is some fundamental view, which, which we might call wisdom, right. some kind of fundamental view we might call wisdom. And we have to be willing to return to it again and again and again as a meditation. There are very few activities in human experience where all of those qualities emerge in any one experience. You may say to someone in sports or in war or anything else, say, can you uh, have all of those running on the high level? Oh yes, in chess. No, no. At uh, tennis? Bridge. In what? See, only the most important interrelationships. Love, human understanding. So therefore, as you emerge into the need for these things, you're entering into a more interesting total relationship. And the person who brought into the world the whole art of dialogue is Plato and Socrates just as the whole art of contemplation emerged with Buddhism. Because Buddhism used two things, not just meditation, which was already there, but an un he brought to it an understanding of what he went through and what he saw as a consequence of it. So he brought understanding with him, as well as that. Here, purely understanding, but it ends up into a contemplative state. So they both have similar features. Understanding, understanding, need for contemplation, need for contemplation. See, that was a long time to answer a simple question. I'll have, <laughs> I'll have to watch that. <laughs> I kind of, uh, uh, you know, as you're describing Buddha, uh, there is no uh, talk by him of... Uh, uh, on what I would call God. Uh, I'm not talking about a God in the sense of Christianity or... No, 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 no. You know, there is a... Uh, uh, when somebody breaks through to mm -hmm. the other dimension, which mm -hmm. is uh, mm -hmm. I consider to be a, a, mm -hmm. an energy dimension, an energy of consciousness, mm -hmm. uh, when you break through, mm -hmm. it, it is such a, uh, a wild world because it is so possessive and inflationary. Uh, uh, you know, that's where the unconscious is, uh, mm -hmm. or as Carl Jung said, there's also a shadow or a dark side to it. Uh, there's no, uh, there's no mention of that in Buddha at all. No. Uh, or, or no mention of that in Socrates, like Not they in Socrates missed either. something. Yeah. It's all mental. That's right. Jung never studied Plato. Well, I don't care whether he never studied Plato or he not. Should've. He should have. He should have. Well, fine, but uh, but other people have not stated Jung in the in the right way, in the same way he didn't state Plato. He he stated other people, but uh, 
Uh, does that mean because he did this study in Plato that there's no uh, other world uh, to, to conceive? Uh, you know, there, there, there is no shadow, there is no uh, darker side to, to another dimension of some kind? That, uh, is that what you're saying? That's right. There's no demonic in Plato or Socrates. That's right. Yeah, but it doesn't mean that, uh, that there isn't any in life. Oh, in life. Yes. Okay, oh, like, listen, okay. I'd be the first to sign that petition. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay. Yes, there certainly is in life. A great well, I know, deal. but they don't seem to address that as part of their, I mean, that's my point, I guess. They don't seem to address that particular part of life. You know, for uh, perhaps, but um, uh, in the Platonic world, he was able to define with great precision the most unjust man, which is the tyrant, the pure evil in that sense, the demonic, without having, of course, the, the theoretic, theoretical underpinnings of the demonic. If we agree that demonic usually means, demonic usually means that there's a fundamental antagonism at the basis of reality between good and evil. Well, I don't necessarily, right. necessarily And I, I'm, I'm saying that's not, that's your asterism, Judaism, Christianity, and it doesn't enter into yes, the Platonic, uh, okay. yeah, yeah okay. it doesn't enter into the Platonic okay. world. But in the everyday world, the personification of the most unjust man is the tyrant, and that's the whole subject of the Republic. How he comes into being, he has to show both. You see, in, the Pla in Plato's Republic, you take all of this together. How did someone become like this? And what kind of a person would it be who in fact has none of those things? And therefore, you have this opposition between the two types of people, but it doesn't okay. go into the level of metaphysics. Okay, but he doesn't. He also doesn't talk about archetypes or gods. Oh, uh, you know what I consider energy entities. They don't seem to address that part. That, that there's something beyond the personal. Yes. Yes. The same thing happens later with in Buddhism, with uh, Avalokitesvara, Maitreya. Each one of these Buddhist deities... Oh, they add something to it? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, but Buddha did not. Buddha did not. That came later with uh, Mahayana. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay, what did they add? Or Northern School. They, you know, they added the, the, the archetypal dimension? Yes, yes. Oh, yes, decidedly. Okay. Yeah. And in the Neoplatonic world, just follow this logic, and I think perhaps we can share an idea. Um, if there is such a thing as this, capital I, right? if that is a principle, and if that principle also is causative, right? and therefore, if it is something therefore that is causative, that um, can reach through levels of existence, And if this particular idea that we're talking about can be then personified, then in the Platonic, Neoplatonic world it becomes a god or goddess. Well, don't they say that, that Jung actually used the word archetype? Uh, it was connected to, to Plato's uh, ideas or forms? I mean, that's what I've read in, in various books that, that, that Jung did uh, his, his archetypal ideal really was related to Plato. Well, I think that that is certainly true, but in his introduction to the Tibetan Book of the Dead, uh, he says that the controlling idea that he had for archetypes came out of the Tibetan Book of the Dead when he, could, when, when he studied the peaceful and the wrathful deities. That's where he got the polar opposites. Well, I know, but, he, but he also found it in other, yeah. other stuff. If you read, if you read him, more, more thoroughly, you'll see where he, he talks about all kinds of stuff. He was the first oh, yeah. scholarly man. Yes, but okay. yeah, I'm just pointing out that okay. in his earlier work where he well, made a commentary to, on I've heard this into Okay, okay. <laughs> Listen, anyone who's written close to 40 volumes, you certainly can have fun quoting him. You can go anywhere you want. And he's just a prolific and very interesting author. Um, which is certainly worth getting people together who are experts in this field. Question? Is 
Is this what's considered idealism? No. That's a misuse of the term, actually. You see, um, in, the, in the Platonic realm, you see, the, the word idea is such a terrible word. It's a Greek word, idea. Right? It's a Greek word. It really means to behold. Now, for Plato, these fundamental fit like this. And um, they entail one another. And when it's experienced directly, when it's experienced directly, it is an overwhelming experience of beauty itself. Phenomenologically, in the sense of how would you describe the experience itself, it's described as right, a divine luminosity. All right, that's the way, the impact. All right? That's what you call it. When you reflect upon it, you say, good heavens. That has a vitality, same as in Buddhism. Right? It has a vitality. Hey, you know what? It's a, a mind. It's mind, mind, mind. Mind itself, or intellect itself. Use a better word, intellect. Hmm. And it's into the very nature of what reality is. And I can make these distinctions on reflection. On reflection, I can make distinction. I can say. Uh, Beauty. Uh, there's a balance. Uh, there's an integrity. Um, Did you say that this big certainty of God is sort of like something of value, something that's good? Yeah, yeah, this is, yes. And would this you is. This, every, would you say that everything else is sort of yeah. down from it? Therefore, everything that comes down from it, the influence of it, is what is called goodness. Pardon? Everything has flowed down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, it is a uh, unfolding. That's yeah, right. A, I, don't, I don't mean these terms. Are I don't know. No. Sometimes the image is a fountain overflowing, okay. since it's an emanation. Sometimes it's a participation model. These are different ways of talking about the same thing. So the negative states of existence wouldn't flow down out of that. The negative states of existence? Um, no. Uh, well, uh, we were just previously trying to figure out this dark side. It wouldn't have a dark side to it. Oh. Um, see. Um, I mean, I'm sitting in a cave. It's pretty dark in there, right? But, yeah. I mean, this is some sort of... Uh, yeah, but keep talking. The dark side is when we take what we think we know and act upon it, isn't it? Well, sure, yeah. But and insofar as we think we know it, we think we're right. Well, you don't have to act on it. You, you, you can know it exists. You don't have to act on it. But there is a space in which when people do think they know, they do act upon it. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. I'll take that I'm acting on something. Is it possible that there's something internal inside of me at birth that makes me act that way? I guess what I'm trying to figure out is if I'm, if I'm playing this game, am I, am I fighting against some internal uh, stuff that I... Well, I guess there is. There's, there's probably some archetypes in there, right? That I, that, that, I don't hold to that notion. I yeah, know, I no, no. I'm, I, I can understand what you're saying, but I myself don't hold to that notion. How about I don't think that we are that we play against ourselves to bring about our own downfall. Uh, I think that we act, we act in such a way as that we always act towards what we think is good, and so long as we think it's good and we have reasons for engaging it and the hope that it will bring us about the good that we desire, we act on it. So that's the first five. Yeah, yeah we sort of get ourselves yeah. involved. In and the way out is to try to describe and try to find out why you're going after things, which in another sense you may realize is not good for you well, and may not get you the things that you want. Then you have to go through the unexamined life is not worth living. Is it possible that you know, that little tiny ball that's crystal clear before you start playing the one, two, three, four, five game, when you play the one, two, three, four, five game, something settles in, doesn't it? Uh, could, you help, could you help me with one, two, three, four, five game? <laughs> Perception, ideas. Oh, oh, okay, okay. The condition arising. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, this 
all these conditions are going to fall into some substrate, right? That's right. So that's right. It's just a, a beautiful ball with all this crud on it, right? That's right. The ball doesn't come with any internal that's screw right. ups in it that's right. or, or structure to it. Yes, and the Buddhist metaphor would be would be that there's accumulation of uh, ignorance. ignorance. Fundamental, ignorance. fundamental the problem of ignorance, right. and it has various sources. And there we are. Um, they don't have the see. They don't have the role of understanding. That's a Platonic. They have, look here, the real thing to do is to understand how this came into existence. You say that, you mean the process of the Buddhist, yes, 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 yes. The process of meditation is literally to be able to see whatever comes up, how you relate to what comes up. That's a meditation. So that you can see in the slightest, yeah, go ahead, excuse me. Oh, you want to see to what degree you can see your, your whatever there is called mind is either pulling away or attracted towards something. And they're going to say, that's the problem. So you see what you're doing? You're either being attracted to it or running away from it? Retract, traction, repulsion, that's a problem. Let it go on, forget it. Just learn to let it happen, just let it be as it is. Watch it, just watch, just watch, watch it arising. So you're saying letting it go is the wisdom? The ninth level was wisdom. Because it ends. It ends. It, it ends in that. Yes. That's right. That's right. So the wisdom is letting go of the push-pull situation, or the, the on every level. The, yeah, on every level. level. And and on the other side of it, though, is not just to, to, to see to see it happening. If you can see it happening, then you are in fact confirming his teaching. Then you're seeing that it's with desire that you see it, but you don't attach it. Either. That's right. You're detached okay. from it. Yeah, yeah. That's the wisdom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a hard. That's a hard. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. oh, man. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> you are so right. Yeah. 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 And you better not get any satisfaction in doing it either. <laughs> not even remotely, or you're attached to your seeing. Yeah. You know, there was another Greek philosopher that, uh, that lived a few, a few uh, years before uh, Socrates. His name was Heraclitus. He was quite well known. And Heraclitus, he, and he yeah. had a little saying that is quoted in, 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 in Jungian works. Uh, fate is character. Character is fate. Heraclitus said that around, around 500 BC. Uh, that gives you a, another little equation to the thing that's right. that, that's that you're right. born with that's character right. or fate, and and that that has uh, you know uh, in our present day thinking uh, that would be called genetics or the archaic structure of the body uh, that has a, a a pull in it that has more or less instinctual and or unconscious, and, and therefore it would uh, it would be driving you to a certain extent. We come yeah one of the great riddles and it's certainly a major riddle, is how do we account for the differences that we all have from one yeah. another? Right? Did you come in with it? Did you pick it up at the moment you were born? Is it genetic or, you know, et cetera? Where, did, where is all of this inheritance that you came along with and whether you need to hypothesize another realm in order to, to justify your conclusion brings you to the idea of reincarnation or genetics or chemistry or biochemistry. Yeah, something. Yeah. Therapy question. I just want to All right, sure. calibration here. Um, therapist says uh, you've got these reactions. There's some deep. Therapist says, well, I've got some reactions I've got, right? But it's certainly been. All right. Just you know what a reaction is? I think someone is saying that um, there's a cause and effect and you respond to something automatically. Is that what they want yeah, to say? I think that's what so they say that, you know, there's conditions on, on the response yeah. that bring them about. Yeah. So if I see the conditions coming, I'm trying then to not have that reaction 
And what they were saying was you try and you try and you try, and after a while you stop trying because you just become. In other words, you, you, you don't have the reaction anymore. But I think what you're saying, you're saying this is extinction, more than that. extinction of a, of, of, yeah, but you're saying more than that. You're saying yeah. just every ordinary, ordinary experiences, which aren't reactive, are. That's right. Clouds. That's the Buddhist experience. That's right. Okay. That's right. So your 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 Buddhist therapy would probably take away all my, all my connections to the to the outside world, right? I mean, all my senses, my ideas, thoughts. Uh, is that what would happen? I mean, if you really went into this, uh, you know. And, and work on it for a long time. <laughs> I mean, you become a nothing, right? I have one quote. I, was, I, I need a quote. A great quote. The monk who has attained sana vatiyata niroda, the highest, his bodily activities, verbal activities, mental activities have all stopped, have subsided, but his vitality is not destroyed. His body heat is not allied. His senses are purified. This, sir, is the difference between a dead thing passed away and that of a monk. I'd like to see one. <laughs> to stand at the summit of consciousness, this is another one, all right? It may occur to think at all is inferior. It would be better not to think. So he stops thinking or willing. And perception ceases. He touches sensation. Pardon me. He touches cessation. Thus does the gradual and deliberate attainment of cessation occur. Is that the point where he can consciously turn off all the psychic apparatus, all the ways of interacting? And that's their, that's their final step. That's the ninth stage. Great quote, one of my favorite ones. Which is very, which is very different from Socrates. He has to have an interaction. Um, you're not comparing similar things. What you would be, what you have to, what you want to describe, is is there any relationship between that and the experience of the good itself? Right, that's that's a different way of comparing. Right. Um, you want to compare comparables. Right, that's well, the I, highest meditative state. You want to compare it against the highest meditative state. I thought the loss of mental function. Pardon? I thought it was the loss of mental function you talked about. <clears throat> well, it's a, it, it isn't. Um, I, it would be nice if they said that. Uh -huh. um, oh right. Yeah. But that's not what they said. That's true. It's a choice they made. Yeah, you kind of added to it. Yeah. In these dialogues, Socrates basically saying, what do you know? Well, you don't know anything, right? It, I mean, not that blunt, but I mean, they go through this big discourse and dialectic, and finally the guy goes, yeah, you're right, I don't know anything. And the guy just, you know, Socrates basically. No, he, he, would, he would then say, uh, ha, ha, uh, must be some interesting state you're in to know that you don't know. Mm -hmm. What kind of knowing is that? You mean there's a kind of knowing which is not knowing? Uh, sure. Oh, what other marks does it have? Excuse me? What other marks does it have? See, watch, watch, go ahead. Yeah. Well, what, what, you undoubtedly are familiar with that state, like right now. Right? I could say, hey, do you know that you don't know? Yeah, I know that. Oh, oh, is that dull? Bored? Ordinary. Ordinary, yeah. Ordinary. Ordinary in the sense that you could fall asleep, it's so ordinary. Like, oh, yeah, fall asleep for all the time. Yeah, yeah. In that state? Of, in that state? Uh, no. Oh, no. Then tell me what's different between that and that ordinary state where you're likely to just slip off into a doze. Uh, I'm in a doze I don't know either. What? It's more profound now. 
more profound. Yeah. Dull? Uh, no, you said profound. Well. <laughs> okay, okay. I'd be interested if you could put more words on that state of mind when you realize, hey, I know that I don't know. Oh. Is, isn't all I see in the dialogue is Socrates is trying to get somebody to realize they don't know over and over and over again, which where does all that lead? I mean Yes, that's true. See, there are different kinds of dialogues and the ones you're talking about, you're quite right. He also in the Republic goes on to the quest of knowledge. The quest of knowledge, you see, if we can just stay with where you are just at the moment, maybe I can push you a step further. Um there's something interesting to realize that you don't know, isn't it? When you have to say, I don't know. Is that true? I don't. Well, I, I know, yeah, from, I know I don't know. Yeah. You know that you don't know. I know know. I, can't stop, I can't stop my perceptions. Uh, uh, I can't become an enlightened monk right now. I mean, I'm not. I mean, the guy we were just talking about earlier, you know, he's sitting there with just a heartbeat. That's mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. No perception. Mm -hmm. No outside. <laughs> <laughs> See, 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 the point you're on is a really great one. The, the, the point you're on is a great one. Let me put it in another way. Um, if you get a description of the ninth stage, a person could say, that's very commendable for a rock. <laughs> see, therefore, the person has to make a distinction between the rock and enlightenment. And that's where you're now getting into something much more interesting. You become one-pointed, that's all. Ekagrata, it has to go beyond one-pointed. That's the eighth stage, yeah. The information's there, but you're just detached. I mean, the not knowing, it's not that you don't really know, your brain has it, but you're detached from all the things that, the senses. Finish it. And if one is no longer attached, one can then do. That's where the natural wisdom comes. Yeah. Because then whatever you're doing, you're not doing it on the basis of anything that's been conditioning you to be anything, this or that. But that's what they sometimes call the, uh, the, uh, wu wei or, or uh, being that, that the way things are. Yeah, yeah. There's another famous quote of, uh, in, in Buddhism that carries this as well in the early teachings, which is the purification of one's mind is the whole study and the essence of Buddhism. So it's in that sense, the purification of the mind. From that point, then you can be. Right, in that sense of non-condition. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.